Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy, and this is a special series on the topic of how to talk policy and influence people. Today, I am joined with Dr. Louise Kenny, and I am super excited to be talking all things maternity and baby health wise. Thanks for joining me, Louise. Hi, Jane. It's a pleasure. So, Louise, um, can you tell me a bit about your background and how you got into being a gynecologist, please? Yeah, so, uh, so I, I'm an obstetrician and gynaecologist. I, I trained in the UK uh, at Liverpool Medical School. Um, and as a medical student, I originally thought that I would end up doing sort of acute adult medicine of some description, cardiothoracic or cardiology. Um, and I haven't really given obstetrics and gynaecology as a specialty much thought. Um, but the minute I did my first attachment, um, and I was at a baby's birth, I, I was hooked, that was it. And from that moment onwards, I knew that um, that was the only, only career for me. So when I graduated, I, I pursued that as a career, initially in the Liverpool region. Um, but after I qualified, I realized I, I quite wanted to pursue an academic track. So I had to leave uh, Liverpool where I trained to undertake a PhD. Um, and this was a quite a long time ago now. Before that was the norm, really, when you couldn't do both. You had to do, you know, take time out of your clinical training to do a PhD. Um, so I did a PhD in uh, in vascular biology, really, but with an emphasis on adverse pregnancy outcomes. Uh, and then after that, pursued an academic career. So uh, firstly, as a lecturer, and then a senior lecturer in Manchester. And then in two thousand and six, I moved back to Ireland, where my family are from. Um, and eventually set up uh, the National Perinatal Research Centre Infant, um, largely based at Cork, but incorporating most of the large maternity units in Ireland. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing um, piece of, I suppose, uh, uh, research and, you know, very motivated to understand outcomes for moms and babies better at UCC. We, we might talk about that a, a little while later, Louise. But um, so have you often engaged in the policy making process throughout your medical career um i mean i suppose it depends on what you think as often but uh, i guess i guess in some ways i have um my particular research interest is adverse pregnancy outcomes and at a very uh, tender age uh in my career um, I was, and as a woman, and at the time as a young mother, I was horrified to learn that adverse pregnancy outcomes or perinatal medicine accounts for about 10% of the global disease burden. Um, it contributes an enormous quantity of morbidity and mortality, and yet it attracts an, a tiny fraction of the research spend. Um, I think a comparison is that it gets about 3% of the research spend compared to like for like um, diseases that cause similar uh, similar burdens um, and so that uh, out simultaneously outraged me and inspired me um, and, it, and the particular interest the particular research interest that I have in um, in adverse pregnancy outcomes and particularly preeclampsia I mean this is a condition that's was described by Hippocrates, but I suspect, I've long suspected, because it only affects pregnant women, it has received very little scant attention over centuries in terms of our understanding of it. Um, and so I became very involved at an early stage in advocating for uh, more funding, for increased RDI funding for all pregnancy research, but particularly adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, became very involved in developing guidelines for the treatment of this condition so that we could bring some some scientific some evidence base to the management of women with this this desperate disease um, and then through that really became involved in um, human rights issues around reproductive health um, bodily autonomy which then segued into reproductive rights when I moved to Ireland and realized that things were really quite dire mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, consent in, in labour and, and pregnancy, that's sort of been a, another issue that I've um, uh, always been interested in and have advocated around. Just to, um, to talk a little bit about preeclampsia, I have an idea of what it is, partly because mm. I've seen Downton Abbey and one of the girls <laughs> died from it, unfortunately, in that, partly because I had high blood pressure in my own pregnancy and um, I know they were concerned that it might turn into that. So can you just tell us what actually is preeclampsia and what are the risks for women and babies there? 
Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's quite a common condition. It affects uh, somewhere between 3 to 10% of all first-time pregnant mothers, depending, depending on your age and also on um, there is some ethnic variation, although it does affect every ethnic group, every socio-demographic group, every age group. Uh, and as I said before, it's, it's been described, it's been known since antiquity. I think Hippocrates described it, and there are certainly ancient uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics that depict women suffering from this disorder. Um, because we understand very little about it, it's still defined by the signs and symptoms it presents with. So it presents with high blood pressure and also leaky kidneys, protein in the urine. Women can get a lot of swelling. Mm -hmm. And if the disease advances to a very serious uh, stage, women can also have convulsions. And, and you, you reference Lady Sybil in Downton Abbey, but she died of eclampsia, which is a sort of end stage okay. complication of, of preeclampsia. Um, so it can be very serious for the mum and it, we estimate that it uh, kills somewhere in the region of 72,000 pregnant women every year uh, globally, which when you consider that these are women who uh, by definition are relatively young because they're pregnant, relatively healthy because they got pregnant in the first place and they die of a condition that we we have very little understanding of is, is quite shocking. The hidden morbidity from it though really is what affects the baby. So babies that are born early or small or both as a result of a preeclamptic pregnancy um, often have very short term um, complications, you know, all the uh, associated difficulties of being born prematurely. And if they survive that, then we now know through um, developmental programming, they're much more likely to get type two diabetes, metabolic disease, hypertension, cardiac disease, and later life. So it's a disease that has a massive legacy, both for mum and baby. And as I say, it's poorly understood and has received a fraction of the R&D um, funding that it, it really deserves. And I've spent the last 25 years of my life really researching it, um, both in the laboratory and in, and in the clinic at the bedside. Okay, and I presume then uh, a major re reason that it's, it doesn't get wider investment globally and in this country is because it affects women and babies. And um, yeah. basically, you know, it's... I'm pretty it's, certain that that's, that's yeah. the main reason, right? So, I mean, the drugs that we give to prevent uh, complications from the condition, I mean, there is no cure. That's the, the, the main thrust of the problem. The only cure is delivery of the baby. Um, but the drugs that we use and the treatment strategies we use to stabilize women pending delivery are really, have really been repurposed from other branches of medicine. There's very little uh, novel or new in, in preeclampsia. And I've long suspected, and I think it's been proven without doubt now, that the reason why not just preeclampsia, but a range of other women's health issues receive a fraction of the, the funding that they should uh, deserve on a level playing field is because they only affect women. And for many decades, um, women have not populated the committees and funding bodies that designate grants. Uh, women have not been uh, leading the research in laboratories and in hospitals. Um, you know, so it's taken a while for women's voices to be heard and for these conditions to receive the, uh, the appropriate amount of funding and attention. So I met you uh, once before at a Labour Women event in Cork. This is going back now a few years. I can't remember exactly when, but it was before repeal of the Eighth Amendment. And I where right, yeah. the event was about reproductive rights in and of mm -hmm. itself and maternal health and that type of thing. We'll talk about repeal in a second. But if I recall correctly, one of the things you mentioned was that midwife-led care is actually generally... Um, nearly better for women's outcomes or uh, am I misremembering that? No, not so. I, I think we, at the event, we were discussing the fact that um, at the time, and in fact, in parts of Ireland still, women uh, cannot avail of uh, anatomy scanning. Uh, so a, a sort of mid-trimester fetal and anatomical survey. It's a standard of care that would be routine in most high income countries, but wasn't in Ireland for a variety of reasons that um, in and of themselves, is, is, there's probably a PhD thesis in that, but um, we were campaigning for, uh, for the rollout of national uh, anatomy scanning. Um, and we discussed at, uh, at that session, um, the sort of very rigid and some would say patriarchal way that uh, obstetric care um, had developed in, in Ireland. So it was still very much hospital based, not community based. It was still very much determined uh, and delivered by doctors rather than midwives. Um, our home birth rate is very low. Uh, we have very few midwifery-led units, birthing centres. Um, 
and um, all of these things have a place in in modern antenatal care. I think the key uh, the key out the, the key thing for women is choice, mm -hmm. the, the ability to choose what's right for for any woman, uh, and to be served by a service that is safe, uh, appropriate, and well staffed. Um, and you know, Irish maternity services, you know, arguably have been safe or safe-ish over many years, but they certainly haven't offered women choice. Mm. Um, and they certainly haven't really put the woman at the centre of, of care. It has been, you know, quite hospital based, quite rigid um, and quite determined by, by doctors. Um, and, and from, you know, coming back to Ireland from the UK, where I, you know, I think it's fair to say antenatal services were, had been on that journey and had evolved. And we were very much talking about women centred antenatal care, you know, in the late 90s and early noughties. So when I came back to Ireland, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a whiplash, a cultural whiplash to see that it was like going back in time, really, to, you know, to the UK, maybe 20, 20 years previously. Well, one thing that I know from friends of mine is that um, if they have health insurance, the desire is to have consultant led care for whatever mm -hmm. reason. They believe that that's in their best interests and in the best interests of their baby. Why do you think people, if they can afford it and have the health insurance, believe that? Is, is there a failure to communicate about um, the fact that midwife led care is safe and that you don't need to go for the maximum um, because these would be people who don't necessarily have any kind of high risk pregnancy yeah. or normal pregnancies, you know, so they don't need as much uh, visits to the doctor or maybe they don't want to wait. I know there are advantages to it, but why do you think there's the actual belief there that this is what I need, this is what's best for me and my baby? I mean, it's not completely erroneous. I think what women want in, uh, and need in pregnancy is continuity of care. They need to be, they need, uh, pregnancy is a really special time, but it's also a very vulnerable time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember myself as a very young first time mum, what mattered to me most was that I had trust in my caregivers and that I knew them and we had that, that personal connection. Uh, and I think that's what women want. They, they, they want and need continuity of care. And certainly back, you know, certainly when we, we first met at the, um, at the uh, event uh, you mentioned, there wasn't a huge amount of choice. If you wanted to see, if you wanted that continuity of care and you wanted to see the same doctor at every visit and you had consultant-led private antenatal care. Um, back in 2011, 12, um, after quite a few years of advocating and, and really trying, we managed to establish a domino team um, at the Liverpool, uh, sorry, at the Cork University Maternity Hospital, which provided a, a sort of similar continuity of care from a small team of de dedicated midwives. Um, but before then, there wasn't that choice. Mm -hmm. So I think there's been a cultural and historic kind of uh, tendency for women who can, who have health insurance and who are lucky enough to be able to afford it, uh, to opt for consultant-led care because it offers that continuity. Um, but that's all they're buying. They're buying continuity and familiarity and they're not buying anything that they really need. You can right. get that level of support, that one-to-one -one continuity from, from a midwife or from a small team of midwives. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's how I had my first baby. I was looked after by a small team of midwives um, who saw me all the way through my pregnancy and who were there with me during labor and who provided all my antenatal care. Um, I can still remember their names. I can still remember wow. their faces. Yeah. I can still remember their touch. It was, you know, as a very young and, and, and at times quite frightened first time mum, it was just what I needed. I, and in fact, I think it's what the vast majority of women need and want if only they had the choice and the option. That's a really interesting point because I went with um, midwife led care, I think, but because I had high blood pressure, I then ended up seeing various doctors mm -hmm. and consultants and I didn't, I suppose, have that continuity, but I felt myself, you know what, they're all well trained. They're all decent. I actually met your husband, Matt Hewitt, at one point <laughs> and I got great care all around. But what I would say is I got a sense that midwifery was quite special because um, I did have lots of different midwives and they were all remarkable. And for about five minutes after the birth, I was thinking, oh, if I had my time over again, there is something <laughs> remarkable about this, this work. Yeah. You know? Um, there is. I mean, it's 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 a privilege, actually. I I I used to. In fact, I always say that. Um, that you know, it's, every job has its has its moments, and obstetrics can be 
can be that it is the happiest job on the planet but it can be the saddest as well but even on really difficult days i remember that it is an absolute privilege to be a small part of what inevitably is the best day of someone else's life um and yeah it is it is special it is special so you're you're back in the in liverpool these days mm. louise but do you still sometimes ha come back to cork yeah, I'm speaking yeah. from Cork right now. So, are you okay? yeah. 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 the road, yeah. in, 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 <laughs> just over the road. Yeah, no, so um, yeah, so I took a career break from uh, the HSE and UCC where I worked. I, I worked for both as an academic uh, a few years ago. Um, the university that I, where I trained um, had uh, had a position as uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor position in the faculty where I was a student was available and. Um, I looked at it and was really quite tempted to go back to the university where I trained in the city where I grew up. Um, so I took a career break and um, I moved back to the UK. But like a lot of people, I did the, t the weekly commute because as you mentioned, my husband, Matt, is still working at, in Cork. He's a gynecological surgeon. And my very elderly parents also live with us in Cork. My father has quite advanced dementia and um, my mum is in care and we, we support my parents in in that so um so the deal was that i would do the weekly commute so uh, but obviously we've moved we've closed all campus-based research in recent weeks because of um covid19 so i've been home isolating in cork um and i'm, I'm here most weekends and, and on holidays okay and so obviously um you were a vocal medic you know in this repeal the eighth campaign and you know, it was um, a remarkable time, very fraught, I think, with nerves for a lot of people to, to wonder, could we get this over the line? Particularly if you think back to only a few years ago, um, 2012 or whenever it was, that poor Savita Halapanavar lost her life due to the Eighth Amendment. And many women, I'm sure, that you worked with over the years, unfortunately, who had cancer or other conditions and the, the Eighth Amendment got in the way of of maybe care that would have met their needs here in Ireland that they maybe had mm. to travel when they shouldn't have had to. Um, as a doctor and as a woman and as a mother and just a human being, were you very um, relieved and thrilled that <laughs> the constitution was changed? Oh yeah, um, I, I think um, I think I will remember, no matter how old and demented I get, I will remember the day that the, I will remember the moment the exit polls reported and the overwhelming sense of relief, um, relief and joy um, that I felt. Um, I, I think, you know, I can remember almost every, every moment of that day. I remember the, there was, obviously there was a media moratorium and I've been doing, I, I'd taken, my, my boss in Ireland was really, the vice chancellor of the university where I worked, Liverpool, had been really supportive because when I actually took the job, I said, look, there's a big campaign coming up in Ireland and I've been quite involved in it. And it's, um, I think there's going to be a referendum in, in the spring. And as it turned out, it was May. Um, so this was in October uh, of the year before. And I said, I, I need to, I'll need to take some time off. Um, I'll take some unpaid leave if that's okay, but I need to be able to campaign and to um, canvas and to do as much um media stuff as possible and my entire team and my boss in particular were incredibly supportive so i'd been home for pretty much two weeks before before the vote sort of doing canvassing every night and doing quite a lot of media um but that day there was nothing to do because there was a moratorium so all i had to do was vote <laughs> so yeah. my mum dad and i went to vote and um it was a beautiful sunny day and i was thinking what what to do now <laughs> so, uh, so the day seemed to go you know I was watching a lot of the home to vote on Twitter and uh, it was amazing yeah uh, and yeah and then there was that sort of peak up to the exit polls and uh, I, I burst into tears I mean it, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm normally quite a contained person I'm quite calm particularly under pressure you have to be in, in yes. my specialty in my job um, but it was almost just like a font of emotion and um, I burst into tears um, uh, it was with, with just joy and relief. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't yeah. the only one I'd say in Ireland <laughs> weeping with joy and relief. And and did you see it coming, Louise? You know, from having been on the doorsteps the, the, the few weeks before, um, did it take you by surprise that it passed it did, that I, margin? I think, um, you know, well, I look at my parents' generation. So my mum my and dad are traditional, you know, Irish Catholic, um, lovely 
lovely couple in their in their eight. Well, my mum's actually eighty today, but oh, um, you know, so my mum was in her late seventies. My dad was in his eighties at the time, and they've had a very traditional upbringing. You know, I, I had a very traditional Irish Catholic upbringing, um, but something about that generation really surprised me. Um, that generation knew people, women who had to travel. They're, they were the daughters of friends. They were uh, friends of their own going back many years. You know, family members. They 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 carried that burden with them. And you know, if I, when we started the campaign, I thought that's the generation we need to win over. And in fact, I don't think it was. I think we had them at we had them at let's have a referendum. You know, as as you know, subsequently was proven. Uh, but on the doorstep, absolutely, um, there were an enormous quantity of of people that I spoke to who by you know if you were going on just the stereotypical appearance you'd think oh this is going to be a no vote uh, and they they just quietly surprise you you know mm -hmm. and and I heard some profoundly moving disclosures you mm -hmm. know on the doorstep um and and sometimes it was what people didn't say rather than what they said that made me think you know you know exactly why we're doing this and I know you've, I've got your vote um but nevertheless, I mean, even though even though I was incredibly optimistic and buoyant, um, there's always that nagging doubt, right? And um, yeah. especially, you know, especially if you go into the black hole that is Twitter or social media, and you see, I mean, some of the vile stuff that was being thrown at the yes side on social media. So, um, I mean, I thought we'd do it. I didn't think it would be by such a large margin. Um, and yeah, overwhelming sense of joy and relief. Um, yeah. And do you think, Louise, that the personal testimonies from women, but also from, you know, the men who loved them and supported them, um, that that was a key mover? And also, I suppose, the constitutional, um, uh, the, the kind of the convention, the Citizens' Assembly, were ordinary people who probably came from such a wide spectrum of belief on this issue to begin with, when presented with the facts, the statistics, the health information, the inequality information, plus then the personal narratives of pain and loss and shame. Did that help win hearts and minds, do you think? I'm pretty sure it's the only thing that really made a difference. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think that's been borne out in sort of post hoc analysis of, of um, you know, exit poll data and, and lots of focus groups that have been done during and since the referendum. The one thing that moved people was that personal testimony, backed up by by you know the the sort of witness of of experts, doctors. But really, it was just you know it was just women telling their stories. Um, it was it, it was a, a referendum that I think we 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 won on facts. We won on facts and compa compassion. Um, certainly the the debates, the the posters, <laughs> you know, none of that made much difference at all. I think. Um, in the end, uh, as I think I said on on the day uh, when I was in the castle on the day the of the official of the official count the following day after the after the vote, um, you know we've always suspected that Ireland is a, an intelligent and compassionate people, yeah. and the the referendum proved it beyond doubt. Yeah, it w it was amazing. It was beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. moment. So obviously we've done that, which was a, a major thing to do, because really up until that point, women's lives and health in, 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 in the maternity space um, didn't have the value that they needed to have. And women's choice and bodily autonomy um, was meaningless. They didn't have it. What would you like to see change about maternity services in Ireland now, if anything? Well, I think, um, I, I think we do need to revisit um, the... The legislation that's now in place for termination of pregnancy, I, I think it's um, there are some many good bits of it, but um, it's still failing some women. Um, for example, women uh, who have complex fetal abnormal abnormalities are still being uh, that are diagnosed later, diagnosed after twelve weeks of gestation, um, by the letter of the law in Ireland, are not necessarily um, allowed to have a termination of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. There is this concept of a fatal fetal abnormality, and that's. Um, that's not a medical term. It's not even a legal term. It's a very subjective uh, position, uh, and um, there is a lot of doubt, even amongst um, you know maternal and fetal specialists like myself, as to what constitutes fatal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, certainly in Liverpool, we are still seeing women 
um, at, a, you know, at a later stage in pregnancy who really I think should be cared for in Ireland. So I think we do need to revisit, uh, revisit the termination. It's good, but it's not perfect. Okay, so we're still, um, sorry, we are still then shipping away vulnerable women who need care yeah. at home. Okay. Yeah, women who, particularly those women who are sick and who, or those women who have, um, uh, you know, complicated pregnancies with significant fetal abnormalities uh, are not necessarily always being cared for in Ireland um, because of their, their later gestation and uh, this ambiguity around what constitutes a real threat to her life or um, what constitutes a fatal fetal abnormality. Some of those women are still not being served in Ireland. Um, what I, what's worked really well has been the way primary care uh, in Ireland have, have embraced this. You know, one of the most stripped out, hollowed out, underfunded aspects of our health service. They just rolled their sleeves up and got on with it. Mm. And, and I am in awe, in awe of my colleagues in primary care uh, who have embraced this and have rolled it out. You know, they were ready to go on day one. Come, come January, um, you know, January 2019, they were there and they were ready. But access is still a problem. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of those women who are already marginalised and vulnerable in society, um, that access is, is, is still an issue. Women in, living in direct provision, uh, immigrants who, who haven't, haven't got a passport, haven't got, um, you know, they, 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 these are all women that I still think are quite vulnerable mm -hmm. and are not actually adequately served by our current legislation. Um, and then wider than that, then I, I think, you know, maternity services have, um, maternity services in Ireland have always been safe, right? They've always been exceptionally good. And, um, you know, in many ways, Ireland has led the world in terms of our research around maternity services. But I think choice is still really limited. Um, home births are still uncommon mm -hmm. uh, compared to many high income settings. We don't have many, if any, uh, st you know, stand alongside birthing centres. Midwifery-led care is still not the norm for huge numbers, you know, huge numbers of the uh, maternity units in the in the country, which means large chunks of our population are not being um, are not being offered choice. Um, and and there is an issue still in some parts of the country with access to antenatal diagnostics and uh, fetal anatomy scanning. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know. A bit like a report card lots done but still a significant <laughs> amount more to do but certainly i think we'd all have to agree that um repealing the eighth amendment was probably the single biggest determinant of women actually being able to secure uh bodily autonomy um it certainly has changed other aspects of of obstetrics that weren't immediately about termination of pregnancy but do do pertain to consent you know, particularly around you know the weight of the fetal life versus the mother's life in the eye of the law um so you know i think in, in time you know as history well history writes itself but as history writes itself we'll look back at repeal of the eighth and and that will be the time that there was a sea change uh for reproductive rights and and, and human rights for women in ireland when I was at the um, UN Convention Against Torture hearing in, in 2017, I, I just went there uh, making a podcast series on humanizing human rights, but Philomena Canning, um, who has since uh, unfortunately passed away, but she was there with Midwives for Choice and was mm. talking about how rep um, the Eighth Amendment caused a lot of difficulties in terms of labor ward efficiencies and yeah. where, where a woman's... Um, right to i suppose decide how she wanted to have her baby under kind of normal circumstances um again the fetal life mm -hmm. got not got in the way but there was a, a time frame within which you could have your baby normally and if if it wasn't happening within that you you might have surgical interventions that were perhaps yeah not necessary is no absolutely yeah the eighth amendment had a had a long shadow in that it it did cast a shadow all the way through to birth um so you know women may and again in a, in a in a country where choice is restricted women often choose to do things that might seem less safe or unwise but they're doing that because they feel they and in many cases they do have no option so women may choose to give birth at home uh, in a place that's geographically remote, 
and perhaps in a in circumstances where you might not necessarily automatically support that choice because it it clearly isn't as safe as the the hospital option mm. but if that's the choice mm. you know a hospital a clinical a very clinical experience in hospital or give birth at home then you are forcing women to make you know difficult and sometimes unsafe choices and that's where the eighth amendment came in so i was horrified to find that um women were being told um, being refused um, choice uh, and being told that that wasn't you know appropriate or an option because um, you know the, the the value that the people my fellow professionals were putting on the fetal life in those circumstances was dictating where a woman could choose to have a baby mm -hmm. now you know I often said to consultant colleagues I, I don't necessarily agree with her choice but oh my god I am going to defend it it's, it's her choice it's her body it's her birth it's her day uh, yes I, re I wish she didn't have to make that choice I, I wish that um, we could provide another option but in the absence of being able to do that I would absolutely advocate for a woman to to choose uh, the place of her but you know the place that she births who she births with all of those things uh, and I think that, that Philomena Canning would have had a similar experience in terms of you know swimming against that tide and trying to offer women women a, you know an alternative experience and choice. Mm. Some of my friends had home births actually and found them a wonderful experience. Mm. And uh, you know, there's there's a handful of very experienced practitioners and I presume there's doulas as well around the country, but it's still a very niche experience, isn't mm. it, in Ireland? Yeah, yeah. it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um one of the things, Louise, that I've become very interested in through my PhD research on long sentence prisoners is the issue of childhood trauma and uh, at the impact of adversity in childhood. And through some of the events I've attended, people have discussed as well stress and pregnancy and surges of cortisol and the fact that this can have an impact mm -hmm. on the fetus. Can you, can you tell me anything about that? Is, do we know that stress and pregnancy is harmful both for the mom but also for the baby? We do. So, I mean, this is, this is one of those things that's occupied researchers for, for decades now. So, we, and we've got, unfortunately, some natural and some man-made large-scale population experiments, which have really clued us into this. So if you look at cohorts of children who were born after uh, population exposure to significant stress, like the cohort of babies that were born following the Dutch famine of 1944, the winter famine, women who were pregnant through the the end of the uh, Second World War and experienced that severe famine in Holland. Women who, um, Japanese women who were pregnant during the time of the A-bomb, um, the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs, uh, not geographically close to those bombs, but in a country that had a devastating, um, devastating effect. Uh, we know that those children were born with a range of um, uh, a higher incidence of a variety of different complications and conditions. Um, now, that all those population studies suggest is, uh, you know, a, a, an association, and you know, it's the job of researchers like me to then unpack and find out whether that's just a casual association or whether there's a causal effect. So, my group in in Cork uh, for. Uh, 15 years before I moved to Cork and, and during the time I was at Infant and, and latterly now in Liverpool, have spent a long time looking at more modern uh, epidemiological studies to try and unpack those exposures. And certainly we've shown that women who have a very unique stress, uh, bereavement, the loss of a, a partner or a parent or a child, a first degree relative in pregnancy, um, ha and, immediately before pregnancy and during pregnancy, their children have a higher risk of a range of adverse outcomes, including mental ill health, mm -hmm. um, particularly schizophrenia and affective disorders, but also other conditions, including um, uh, autistic spectrum disorder uh, and uh, you know, a variety of, of other conditions. And, and what's really interesting is that that exposure, that stress has different effects on on male versus female babies wow. and it has different effects depending on when in pregnancy the stress mm -hmm. occurs um, so that would suggest that the association is causal rather than casual uh, particularly when you factor in you know sibling control studies 
Um, the theory that we've been looking at is that the developing fecal brain, particularly um, the hypothalamic pituitary axis mm -hmm. um, and other parts of the brain are very susceptible to cortisol surges and a milieu of other um, chemicals that are uh, dysregulated during a time of maternal stress. Um, but we haven't really got to the molecular basis of that yet. But I think all developmental researchers, all people who work in what we call DOAD, the developmental origins of, of, of disease, are of the opinion that unequivocally maternal stress in pregnancy um, has a very trimester and gender specific effect on the fetus. Mm -hmm. Um, and that effect can be long lasting. It, it may not man manifest until the child itself is in adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's both on, on both mental health, um, but also it can have physical effects as well. We, we know that women who are exposed to stress in pregnancy give birth slightly earlier and they give birth to babies that are slightly smaller. Mm -hmm. And in and of themselves, those two things are also associated with, with long term uh, consequences. So I think um, we, we are certain that there is an effect we're pretty certain it's causal and mm -hmm. uh, we are still unpacking uh, what the the molecular basis of that is it's fascinating and kind of terrifying you know as someone mm -hmm. who's had babies and you have a certain degree of control and then there are things like now with COVID-19 where people have mm -hmm. no control whatsoever and um, you know the stress of that the uncertainty of that um, uh, but I'm wondering as well, so one of the things I learned about uh, in my own PhD research and through groups like Young Nak Nahini and indeed uh, a colleague of yours from Infant, Ali Kishan, is about yeah. adverse childhood experiences. And some of the studies I've read suggest that if a mom has high levels of trauma and adversity in her own history, um, that might make her more at risk during pregnancy, you know, for, for being depressed maybe, yeah. or perhaps might predispose her to being involved in a relationship that is toxic, you know, a, a, a situation of domestic violence or um, just other relational factors. Um, do, do we know anything about uh, domestic violence in, in, in that score, that if a woman is in a violent relationship during pregnancy, I, I've heard of incidences where domestic violence actually goes up as a woman becomes, you know, more visibly pregnant. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Pregnancy itself is a, is a trigger for domestic violence. Women are more vulnerable to domestic violence when they're pregnant. Um, and in fact, we now know that one of the leading causes of maternal death um, isn't the things that I've spent 25 years researching, preeclampsia and, um, and hemorrhage and sepsis. It's actually violent death. Yeah. It's death at the hands of a, a partner or death by suicide. And suicide uh, in itself is more common in women who are subject to domestic violence and who are unsupported, marginalised um, and living at, you know, at the periphery of society. Uh, and unequivocally, um, both exposure to domestic violence um, and surviving a pregnancy that's been uh, exposed to domestic violence predisposes uh, the, those babies to a, again a range of adverse conditions and again it's difficult we don't know what, what the molecular basis of that is is it the the stress the maternal stress or, or is that imprinting in some other way I, I, I was at a conference recently um, presenting some of this work because Ali and I still work quite closely together and still publish together and um, a colleague there was talking about a study that they'd done showing that babies who uh, have been um, uh, born uh, of a pregnancy that's been exposed to regular domestic violence actually um, shrink visibly shrink when they hear the perpetrator's voice wow um, so and that's can only be well I mean there, there are many things that it could be but the the hypothesis that the researcher was advocating is that babies have the cortisol surge and they associate it with the perpetrator's voice and then they physically recoil um, in the in the postnatal space yeah. so yeah I mean the human brain you know we we understand so little it's like the depths of the ocean and outer space you know our knowledge of the human brain is it's evolving but there's still as probably as much that we don't know as as, as much as we do yeah no it's 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 unbelievably interesting there's a guy called Peter Levine who does a thing called somatic experiencing and he he sometimes works with baby or well grown up people or children who've been um 
born by cesarean section. Um, but some of the things that he talks about are the natural kind of um, animalistic reflexes that we have, including the turtle reflex, which is like almost going back into the shell. Sounds a bit like that now with the baby and the voice and the pre-verbal imprint, uh, imprinting. Um, just to return to the subject of unwanted pregnancies, before repeal of the eighth, obviously women um, didn't have a choice in, in mm. Ireland. Well, they could go to England if they had the money and the wherewithal to do so. Lots of people didn't have those options if they were, if they were underprivileged, couldn't come up with the money, lived in direct provision, uh, couldn't mm. get a passport together. I presume as well that an unwanted pregnancy is inherently a stressful pregnancy. Yeah, I mean, and again, that's that's work that has been uh, shown in a variety of different societies in different countries, um, that women who are forced to continue with an unwanted pregnancy are much more likely to experience mental ill health. They're much more likely to experience domestic violence. They're much more likely to self-harm. Um, and and again, that has a legacy effect for the, the baby born as a result of that mm -hmm. pregnancy. I mean, there's always, whenever, we, whenever I have these discussions, I'm always conscious of the fact that we're talking about relative risks mm -hmm. over populations sure. and the absolute risk to any one individual is small because I'd hate for anyone who, you know, has had the shock of a, an unplanned pregnancy and has taken time to, to come to terms with it and then has embraced the pregnancy, has thought that they've done themselves or their baby any harm. The, sure. the, the relative risk, we, we all, we're always talking about relative risks, absolute risks are, are low. Um, but certainly there is there is evidence that in terms of women's mental health and physical health and well-being, continuing with an unwanted pregnancy is far more damaging in the long term than termination of pregnancy. And have we done enough traditionally, um, you know, as, as medical professionals or just as as a society to support women? Um, to support new moms, you know, whether they wanted to the, the pregnancy or not, to like, one, have we asked enough about things like trauma and adversity and domestic violence and other stresses in pregnancy to truly know how prevalent they are for people and whether they have supportive mm -hmm. relationships? And two, is there anything that we can actually do as a society um, to enhance the safety of women? you know, to reduce stress in pregnancy um, and enhance their felt sense of safety in the world so that they are healthy and well, which has a knock-on effect for the baby that they're carrying. So I, I think the short answer to the first question is, uh, no, we haven't, we, we haven't done enough historically um, in, in most high income settings, actually. I think, um, you know, the, we, we've, we've not treasured um, new mothers um, and their babies in the way that I think we now realise is quite important. Um, and in terms of what we can do, I, I think it's it's purely a matter of resource, right? I think women benefit massively from. We talked about we started this talking about one to one care. Mm. Um, I, I think you know, in a, what what would what would perfect, what would excellent look like? I think as a society, I think excellent would look like. Uh, massively increased parental leave that can be used flexibly between mom and dad. Um, we it would look uh, like uh, an enormous uh, investment in postnatal care in the community. Women have in Ireland very little postnatal care, if any. You know they're, they're kicked out of hospital and there's no very little postnatal care. They see the district nurse, but that's more about you know the baby and vaccination mm -hmm. schedule and. Um, so a huge amount more of, of postnatal care, but also more antenatal care with a focus on uh, mental health and well-being. Um, you know, you, you don't find domestic violence unless you look for it. The perpetrators and the victims are often very, very clever at hiding it. Um, and finding it takes time and it takes trust and it takes that personal one-to-one -one relationship and continuity of care. So I, I, I think, you know, it, we're coming back to where we started really with what what would excellent look like and it would be a huge cash injection a huge investment in mothers and babies um, because i think they're worthy of it i mean as a society we often say you can judge how the health of a society by the way it treats its most vulnerable members and 
um, some of our most vulnerable members of society are pregnant women and newborn babies. But newborn babies are the, um, they're, they're, they're what's going to keep us healthy and fit in old age. They're going to be responsible for our pensions, for staffing, the hospitals that, you know, our generation will use in due course. So it's, um, it's a false economy, I think, not to make that investment. And other slightly more enlightened countries uh, ha have caught on to that and are putting appropriate investment in place. If you look at the likes of Finland and other Scandinavian countries, the amount of spend they have in those first 1,000 days from, you know, from conception to the first, uh, first year, two years of life is amazing. Um, so, I mean, and we're, we're, we're getting there. You know, we're doing more, but I, I think not fast enough and we could do a huge amount more and it is being a new mom is is a transformative experience you know but it doesn't always come easy and it can be quite mm. lonely um like i found a very interesting experience but th there are times that being a parent is challenging and boring and isolating and um the thing about being a mom is you are the best buffer for your baby as well of course the dad is also important or whoever else is there to provide support but in terms of um say attachment i, I don't know how, how much you guys focus on that because it's probably more the pre-birth period but in terms of learning how to regulate as a baby and how to feel safe in the world the quality of our primary caring relationship is crucial isn't it louise absolutely yeah absolutely uh, and, uh, and again i mean we 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 probably know only a fraction of what we need to in order to to better protect that and to resource it um interestingly we one of the things that i've just done in the uk is um we we recently were awarded just over 10 million pounds worth of funding to establish a new birth cohort there hasn't been a birth cohort in the uk now for almost 20 years and obviously that's been a really interesting 20 year period in which we've had a massive economic crash and um, we're now looking at Brexit and various other uh, and, and also a very connected social media orientated age. So we're establishing a new birth cohort next year. It'll be a little bit delayed, I think, because of COVID-19. And one of the main purposes of that cohort, uh, unlike cohorts that have gone before, which have all been about the physical health of, of that cohort, is on what determines perinatal mental health and well-being. What do we take from pregnancy and early life exposures into adolescence and, and adulthood? Um, and what frames um, our mental health and well-being you know, in that context? And I think that's incredibly timely given the huge epidemic of mental ill health that we're seeing now. Um, so again, you know, and that's going to be a 20, 30, 40 year endeavor, but we've got to start somewhere, right? And a, a new cohort, I think, is definitely the, the, the building blocks that will hope answer some of the questions that we've just been discussing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I've taken up a heap of your time, but just before we finish, postnatal depression isn't actually all that rare. Sure, it's not something. No, not at all. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in postnatal depression, I mean, we've both been first time mums, <laughs> Jane. So yeah. I remember thinking that I felt like I'd been uh, hit by a truck, knocked over by a train and dragged through a bush and had survived with a baby in my arms. That's what I felt like, you know, after, after uh, my first pregnancy and giving birth. Um, uh, and I had the same same reaction after my second baby. Um, I think I had quite significant postnatal depression after my second baby, and um, I was a junior doctor at the time and really didn't didn't realise it. Um, so you know, I think eighty percent of women, eighty to ninety percent of women, will have the baby blues, that sort of teary, you know, just mm -hmm. um, feeling that they have on day three, which can last for several weeks. Um, more significant antenatal depression, I think, is underdiagnosed, it's underrecognized. I think women are slow to uh, recognize it within themselves. And then we have, you know, very severe, you know, puerperal psychosis, a very, very severe sort of mental health that affects a much smaller number of women, but but can be, you know, very debilitating. Um, and I, I think we're getting, I think we're getting better now at uh, discussing it, at recognizing it. I think GPs and midwives are, are much more attuned to signs of, of postnatal depression. But again, one of my concerns about the lack of postnatal care in Ireland is, um, is that when postnatal depression really kicks in, you know, in, in those weeks after the baby's born, 
that's when that's when you're no longer going to see your obstetrician. Yes. Uh, you're not seeing your midwife in Ireland. You, you're on your own, often uh, at home alone. With you're on your own, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it can be desperately isolating. It's exhausting. Um, you know, it's... Well, you and I have both been there, right? Yeah. Uh, so it, it, I always say to mums who have it, who inevitably feel desperately ashamed and guilty, I am amazed that anyone gets through pregnancy, birth, and the first few months of a, a newborn baby without being depressed. <laughs> Not that go. they have depression. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I, into my own patients, I talk very openly about you know, both of my pregnancies and the experience I had afterwards. Because I think, you know, again, and I, I don't think... It's not particularly an Irish thing, although I do think mental ill health is still quite stigmatised. Mm. Um, and so by talking about it openly, I found that women were much more likely to share. Of course, um, because you allow them to share and also you, mm. you normalise the experience and, and allow the, um, the request for help maybe or to be signposted mm -hmm. to services. Or Also the thing is, if we can't mind ourselves, how can we mind a, a very vulnerable infant, you know, and particularly without wider support. So if you're a single parent without family support and then without um, very rigorous checkups, say from, from public health, could we do more in terms of public health and nursing to tune into these matters or do we, uh, do we do it enough? Well, I mean, I think some of our some of our public health nurses are just fantastic. Many of them are former midwives. Again, it's it's a resource issue. You know, if you look at the the case loading for the average uh, public health district nurse in in Ireland, they have a huge you know case load to see. Um, and you know yourself, Jane, that if you, if you're wanting a, a, an exhausted, tearful, uh, you know, first time mum who's trying to do everything and be everything and be the super mum that she sees on Instagram and you know in all the magazines. Um, you, you can't just say you can't get that information out of her in a in a two minute cursory kind of conversation. It takes time. It takes trust. It takes that. You know, you need that space. Yeah. And so again, it it comes back to what we said. You know, at the start and at the middle, it's about resource. We we need to we need to value women and what they do. Um, and and pregnancy and childbirth and the result of, of pregnancy and childbirth much more as a society. Than I think we currently do, and we need to put our money where our mouth is. Um, it needs resource. Okay. Well, you summed it up fantastically there. Dr. Louise Kenny, I am so grateful for your time and your insults and uh, insults, do you hear me? Uh, insights. Um, I, I, I am so thankful for the work that you do with your various teams around the world um, as a woman, as a mom, as a future granny, hopefully. You know, it's. <laughs> it's um it's 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 marvelous work it's difficult work it's special work and um thank you for talking policy and influencing people around the eighth amendment uh, best of luck for the future and stay safe during COVID 19. thanks, thanks jane and and you too okay